Chapter 10 of The Whole Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Stryker. Automobile. Painted red with yellow lines. Automatic reel. The three dollar kind. New stamp book. The puppy chewed my other. Golly, I forgot. I suppose I mustn't use this. But it's my birthday next month and I want steam things. And I thought I'd better make a list to pin on the dining room door where the family could take their pick what to give me. Lorraine gave me this blank book and told me that if I'd write down everything that I knew about Peggy and Harry Goward and all that stuff, she'd have Sally make me three pounds of crumbly cookies with currants on top in a box to keep in my room just to eat to myself, and she wouldn't tell Alice, so I won't be selfish not to offer any, as she won't know about it and so won't suffer. I'm going to keep them in the extra bureau drawer where Pig puts her best party dress, so I guess they'll be ate up before anybody goes there. Peggy's feeling pretty sick now to dress up for parties, but I know a thing or two that the rest don't know. Wouldn't Alice be hopping? She always thinks she's wise and everything, and to have a thick-headed boy person know a whacking secret that I'll be excited about would make her mad enough to burst. She thinks she can read my ingrown soul too but I rather think I have my own interior thoughts that Miss Alice doesn't tumble to for instance Dr. Denbig golly I forgot Lorraine said she'd cut down the cookies if things weren't or told orderly the way they happened so I've got to begin back first then I've had the best time since Peggy got engaged I'd ever had in my own home. Not quite unbossed as when they sent me on Harris Farm last summer and I slept in a stable if I wanted to and nobody asked if I'd taken a bath. That was a sensible way to live but yet it's been unpacked and pleasant even at home lately. You see with such a lot of fussing about Peggy and Harry Goward, nobody knows what I did, and that, to a person with taste for animals, is one of the best states of living. I've gone to the table without brushing my hair, and the puppy has slipped in my bed. I've kept a toad behind the wash basin for two weeks, though Lena, the maid, knew about it. She shut up and was a de was decent because she didn't want to worry mother a toad is such an unusual creature to live with i've got a string in his hind leg but yet he gets into places where you don't expect him and it's very interesting lena seemed to think it wasn't nice to have him in the towels and washstand drawer but i didn't care it doesn't hurt the towels and it's cozy for the toad i had a little snake a stunner but Lena squealed when she found him in my collar, so I had to take him away. He looked awfully cunning inside the collars, but Lena wouldn't stand for him. So, uh, I let well enough alone and tried to be contended with the toad and puppy and some June bugs. I've gotten boxes and my lizard next to mother. He's my best friend. I've had him six months. I'm not sure I, I wouldn't rather lose mother than him, because you could get a stepmother. But it's awfully difficult to replace a lizard like Diogenes. I wonder if Lorraine will think I've written too much about my animals. They're more fun than Peggy anyway. As for Harry Gower, golly. A toad or lizard that couldn't be livelier than he would be a 
pretty sad animal. A year ago, I was fishing one day away up the Whit River, squatting under a bush on the bank when Peggy and Dr. Denby came and plumped right over my head. They didn't see me, but it wasn't up to me. They were looking the other way, so I didn't notice my fish line either. They weren't noticing much of life as it appeared to me, except their personal selves. I thought if they wouldn't disturb me, I wouldn't disturb them. At first, I didn't pay attention to what they're saying, because there was a chub and a trout together after my bait. And nat I naturally was excited to see the trout take it, but when I'd lost both of them, I, I had time to listen. I wouldn't have believed it of Dr. Denbeg to bother about a girl like Peg, who can't do anything. And he's a whale, just a whale, six feet two, strong as an ox. He went through West Point before he degraded himself into a doctor, and he held the record for shot putting, and was on the football team, and even now, he's very old, and of course, can't last long. He plays the best tennis in Eastridge. He went to the Spanish War quite a while ago, that was, but yet, in modern times, he was at San Juan. You could see that he's a Jim Dandy. And him to be wasting time on Peggy? It's sickening. Even for a girl, she's poor and stuff. I don't mean, of course, that she's not alright in moral direction. And I wouldn't let anybody else abuse her. Everybody says she's pretty, and I suppose she is, in a red-headed way. And she's awfully kind, you know, but athletically, that's what I'm talking about. She doesn't amount to a row of pins. She can't fish or play tennis or ride anything. Yet, all the same is true. I distinctly heard him say he loved her better than anything on the earth. I don't think he could have meant better than Rapscallion. He's awfully fond on that horse. Probably he forgot Rapscallion for the moment. Anyhow, Peg was sniffling and saying how she was going back to college. It was the Easter vacation, and how she was only a stupid girl and he would forget her. He said he'd never forget her in one minute all of his life, which is silly. I've often forgotten really important things. Once I forgot to shop at Lorraine's for a tin of hot gingerbread. She had Sally make for me to entirely eat by myself, and Alice got devoured all up, the pig. Anyway, Dr. Denbig said that, and then Peggy sniffled some more. I he heard him ask her, What is it, dear? Dear, your grandmother, she said. Then, why wouldn't he let her be engaged to him like anybody else? And it was hard on a girl to have to beg a man to be engaged, and then he laughed a little, and they didn't either of them say anything for a while, but there were soft rustling sounds. A trout was after my bait, so I didn't listen carefully. When I noticed again, Dr. Denbig was saying how he was years and years older and it was his duty to take care of her and not allow her to make a mistake that might ruin her life, and he wouldn't let her hurry into a thing that she couldn't get out of, and a lot more. Peg said that Forty wasn't old, and he was young enough for her, and she was certain, certain, I don't know what she was certain of, but she was horribly obstinate about it. And then, Dr. Denbig said, If I only dared to let you, dear, if I only dared. And something about it. if she felt the same in two years or over a year or something. I can't remember. All that truck. And then they said the same thing over a lot. I heard a murmur, call me Jack, just once. 
and she murmured back, as if it was a stunt. Jack, and then rustlings. I call him Jack all afternoon if he liked. Then, after another one of those still games, Peggy said, Ow! As if someone pinched her. And that seemed a queer remark that I stood up to see what they're up to. Getting to my feet, I swung the line around and the bait flopped on the bank and hit Peg square in the mouth. I give you my word, I didn't mean to. But it was awfully funny. My! Didn't she squeal bloody murder? That's what makes a person despise Peggy. She's no sort of sport. Another time I remember I had some worms in an envelope and I happened to feel them in my pocket so I pulled them out and slid it down the back of her neck and you might have thought I'd done something awful. She yelped and wriggled and cried. She did. She actually cried. And you won't believe what she finished up by doing. She went and took a bath, a whole bath, and then, when she didn't need to, she can't see a joke at all. Now, Alice is a horrid meddler, she and Maria, yet Alice is a sport and takes her medicine. I've seen that girl with a beetle in her hair, which I put up there keep her teeth shut and not make a sound, only a low gurgle, until she got him and slung him out the window. Then she lammed me. I tell you, I respected her for it too, but she couldn't now. I'm stronger. <laughs> oh, golly. Lorraine will cut the cookies if I don't tell what happened. I don't exactly know what was next, but... Dr. Denbig somehow had me by the collar and gave me a yank, like a big dog does a little one. See here, you young limb, he said. I'm, I'm going to, and then he suddenly stopped, looked at Peggy, and then began to chuckle. And Peggy laughed and turned lobster color and put her face in her hands and just howled. Of course, I grinned too. And then I glanced up at him lovingly and murmured Jack just like Peggy did that seemed to sober him and he considered a minute listen Billy he began slowly we're in your power but I'm going to trust you I just hooted because there wasn't much else he could do but he didn't smile, only his eyes sort of twinkled. Be calm, my son, he said. You're a gentleman, I believe, and all I need to do is to point out what you've seen and heard is not your secret. I'm sure that you realize it's unnecessary to ask you not to tell. Of course, you'll never tell one word. Not one word. And he glared. That's understood, isn't it? I said, yep, sort of scared. He's splendidly big and arrogant, and he has that man-eating look, but he's a peach all the same. Are we friends and brothers, he asked, and slid a look at Peg. Yep, I said again, and I meant it. Shake, said Dr. Denbig. We took a shake like two men. That was about all that happened that day, except about my fishing. That was real very interesting but I suppose Lorraine wouldn't care for that it was a good deal of strain on my feelings not to tell Alice but of course I didn't but once in a while I'd glance up at Dr. Denbig trustingly and murmur Jack as he would be in a fit because I always do it when the family just barely couldn't hear as soon as Peg came home from college we skipped to the mountains and she went back from there to college again I didn't have a fair show to get rises out of him either and in urgency of steam things like pigeons and the new puppy I pretty nearly forgot their love's young dream I didn't have a surmise that I was going to to be interwoven among it like it 
I was. I saw Aunt Elizabeth going out with Dr. Denbig in his machine two or three times, but she's a regular fusser with men, and he's got a kind heart, so I wasn't wise to anything in that. The day Peg came home for Christmas, she was singing like the blue canaries down the in the parlor and I happened to pass Aunt Elizabeth's door and she was lacing up her shoes oh Billy ask Peggy if she doesn't want to go for a walk will you there's a lamb she called to me so I happened to have the intelligence from pristine sources that they went walking and after that Peg had a grouch on and was off her feed the rest of the vacation. Nobody knew why. I didn't myself, even. And it didn't occur to me that Aunt Elizabeth had probably been rubbing in how well she knew Dr. Denbig. And the last day Peggy was home, at the table, they were chaffing Aunt Elizabeth about him. The way grown-ups do, instead of talking about facts of life and different kinds of horse feed, which is important in the winter, I heard Mother say in a sh sort of vachy tone to Peggy, they, they really seem to be fond of each other. Perhaps there may be an engagement to write about, Peggy. I thought to myself that Mother didn't know that Dr. Denbig was prejudiced being engaged but I didn't say anything it's wise not to say anything to your family beyond the necessary jargon of living Peggy seemed to think the same for she didn't answer syllabus but after dropping her glass of water into the fried potatoes which Lena was kindly handing to her she jumped and scooted a few minutes later I wanted her to sew a snail on a boat so I tried her door, it was locked, and then I knocked, and she took an awfully long time simply to open that door, and when she did, her eyes were red, and she was shivering out as if she was cold. Oh, Billy, Billy, she said, and then, of all things, she grabbed me and kissed me. I wriggled loose and said, Sew up this snail for me, will you? Hustle! But she didn't pay attention. Oh, Billy, be a little good to me, she said. I'm so wretched and nobody knows but you. Oh, Billy, he likes somebody better than me. Who does? I asked. Father? She half laughed. Sort of a sickly laugh. No, Billy. Not father, he, Jack, Dr. Denbig, oh, you know, Billy, you heard what mother said. Uh, oh, I answered to her in a contemplating slowness. Oh, that's so. Do you mind if he gets engaged to Aunt Elizabeth? Do I mind? Said Peggy, as if she was astonished. Mind? Billy, I love him until I die, I... It would break my heart. Oh, no, it wouldn't, I told her, because I'd sort of comfort her. That's truck. You can't break muscles just by loving, but I know how you feel, because that's the way I felt when Father gave that Irish setter to the Tracys. She went on chattering her teeth as if she was cold. So I put a table cover around her. You dear Billy, she said. But that was stuff. I wouldn't bother, I said. Likely he's forgotten about you. I often forget things myself. That didn't seem to come for her, for she began to sob out loud. Oh, now, Peg, don't cry, I observed to her. He probably likes Aunt Elizabeth better than you, don't you see? I think she's prettier myself, and of course she's a lot cleverer, she tells funny stories and makes people laugh, you never do that, you're a good sort, but quiet and not much fun, don't you see, maybe you got plain tired of you, 
but instead being cheered up by my explaining things, she put her head on the table and just yowled. Girls are a queer species. You're cruel, cruel, she sobbed out, and you bet that surprised me. Me, that was comforting her for all I was worth. I pat her on the back of the neck and thought hard of other soothings I could squeeze out. Then I had an idea. Tell you what, Peg, I said. It's too darn bad of Dr. Denbig if he just did it for meanness when you haven't done anything to him. But maybe he got riled because you begged him so to let you be engaged to him. Of course a man doesn't want to be bothered if he wants to get engaged if he wants to and if he doesn't want to he doesn't and that's all I think probably Dr. Denbig was afraid you'd be at him again when you came home so he hurried up and snatched Aunt Elizabeth Peggy lifted her face and stared at me she was a sight, <laughs> with her eyes all bunged up and her cheeks sloppy. You think he's engaged to her, do you, Billy? She asked me. Her voice sort of shook, and I thought it'd be better to settle it for her one way or another. So I nodded and said, wouldn't be surprised. And then, if you'll believe it, that girl got angry at me. Billy, you're brutal. Billy... You're brutal. You're like any other man thing. Cold blooded and faithless and. And she began choking. Choking again. And I was disgusted and cleared out. I was glad when she went off to college because. Though she's a kind hearted girl, she's so. Peevish and untalkative. It made me tired. I think people ought to be cheerful around their own homes, but the family didn't seem to see it. There's such a lot of us, and you have to blow a trumpet before you get any special notice. Except me, when I don't wash my hands. Yet, what's the use of washing your hands when you're certain to get them dirty again in five minutes? Well, then a while ago, Peggy wrote she was engaged to Harry Goward, and... There was great excitement in the happy home. My people are mobile in their temperatures anyway. A little thing stirs them up. I thought it was queerish, but I didn't know. But Peggy had changed her mind about loving Dr. Denbig until she died. I should think that was too long myself. I was busy getting my saddle mended and a new bridle, so I didn't have time for gossip. Harry came to visit the family, and the minute I ex inspected him over, I knew he was a sissy. If you believe me, that grown-up man can't chin himself. He sings and paints apple blossoms. But he fell three-cornered over a fence that I vaulted. He may be fascinating, as Lorraine says, but he isn't worth saving, in my judgments. I said so to Dr. Denbig one day, when he picked me up in his machine and brought me home from school. And he was sympathetic and asked intelligent questions. At least, some of them some of them were j just slow remarks about if Peggy seemed to be very happy and that sort of stuff that doesn't have any foundations. I told him particularly that I like automobiles, and he thought for a minute and said, If you were going to be playing near the Whitman station tomorrow, I'll pick you up and take you on a 20-mile spin. I'm lunching with some people near Whitman and going on to Elmville. Oh, pickles, said I. Will you really? Of course I'll be there. I'll drive over and watch the express man. He's a friend of mine, right after lunch, I said. And I'll wait around the station for you. 
So I did that, and while I was waiting, I saw Elizabeth coming. I saw her first, so I hid. I was afraid if she saw me, she'd find out I was going with Dr. Denbig and snatch him herself. I heard her sending a crazy telegram to Harry Goward, and then I forgot all about it. I wanted to tell distract I Alice's mind some off. cookies that I've accumulated at Lorraine's house. Alice is a pig. She never lets me stuff in peace. So, I told her about the telegram. I knew Alice would be perturbed with that. She just loves to tell things, but she made me tell Peggy, and there's a hola blue promptly. Nobody confided a word with me, and I didn't care much, but I saw them all whispering in low tones and being very busy about it, and Peg looking madder than a goat, and I guess that Alice had made me raise Cain. Now, I've got to back up and start over. Golly, it's harder than you'd think just to write down things the way they happen, like I promised Lorraine. Let's see. Oh, yes, of course. About Dr. Denbig in the bubble. I was in a fit for fear. Dear Aunt, dear Aunt, Elizabeth would linger until the doctor came, and then somehow I'd be minus one driving a machine. She didn't. She cleared out with solidity and dispatch in my aurora, as a school teacher would say. Came in his rolling car, and I popped out, and we had a corking time. He let me drive a little. You see, the machine is, uh, huh? Well, Lorraine said, specially, I was not to describe automobiles. That seems such a stupid restrictiveness, but... It's a case of cookies, so I'll cut that out. There really wasn't much else to tell. Only that Dr. Denbig started right in and raked out the inmost linings of my soul about Peggy and Harry Goward. It wasn't exactly cross-examination because he wasn't cross. Yet he fired the questions at me like a cannon, and I answered quick. You bet. Dr. Denbig knows what he wants, and he means to get it. Just by accident toward the last I let out about that day in the winter, when they were chaffing Aunt Elizabeth at the table about him, and how he'd taken her out in the machine, and how Mother had said there might be an engagement to write Peggy about. Oh, Dr. Dan Big. Oh, oh. Funny the way he went on saying, oh, oh. I thought if that interested him, he might like to hear about Peg throwing a fit in her room after. So I told him that and how I tried to comfort her and how unreasonable she was. And what do you suppose he said? He looked at me a minute with his eyebrows away down and his mouth jammed together and he brought out, You little devil. Uh, that's not the worst he said either. I guess mother wouldn't let me go without, with him if she knew he used profanity. Maria wouldn't anyways. I have decided I wouldn't tell them, but it's uh, the only time I ever caught him. The other thing is this. He said to himself, but out loud, I think he'd forgotten me. So, they made her believe I liked her aunt better. And then in a minute, she said it would break her heart. Bless her and two or three or other interlocutory remarks like that, meaning nothing in particular. And then, all of a sudden, he brought his fist down on his knee with a bang and said, Damn Aunt Elizabeth. Not loud, but compressed and explodingly, you know. 
I looked at him and said, Beg pardon, Billy. Your aunt is a very charming woman, but I mean it. I only asked her to go out with me because she talked more about Peggy than anyone else would. He went on. I thought a minute, and I put two and two together pretty quick. You mind about Peggy's being engaged with Harry Gower, don't you? I asked him, for I saw right through him. He looked queer. Yes, I mind, he said. But wouldn't you wouldn't be engaged to her yourself. I propounded him and grinned and said something about more things in heaven and earth and called me Horatio. I reckon he got stuck crazy a minute and then he made me tell him further what Peggy said and what I said and he laughed that time about my comforting her and Though I don't see why, it doesn't pay to give up important things. To be kind and thoughtful in this world, nobody appreciates it. And you're sure to be sorry, and you took time. When I got upstairs, after comforting Peggy, my toad had jumped in the water pitcher and got about drowned. He never was the same toad after, and if I hadn't stopped in Peg's room to do good... It wouldn't have happened. And Dr. Denbigh laughed at me besides. However, for an old chap of 40, he's a peach. I'm not kicking at Dr. Denbigh. Then, let's see. It makes me tired going on writing this stuff. I wish I was through, but the cookies. I see a vision of a mountain range of cookies with currants on them. Crumbly cookies. Up and at it again for me. The next stunt I had a shy at was a letter that Harry Goward asked Alice to give Peggy, and Alice gave it to me because she was up to something else that minute. She didn't look at the address, but you bet your sweet life I did. When I heard it was from Harry Goward, I saw it was addressed to Peg, and I stuffed it in my pocket and plain forgot because I was in a hurry to go fishing with said Tracy. I put a chub on top of it that I wanted to keep for bait, and when I pulled it out, the letter, the chub, hadn't helped much. The envelope was a little slimy. I said, gee. Sid said, what's that? Um, a letter to my sister from that chump Harry Goward, said I. I've got to take it to her. Looks pretty sad now. Sid didn't like Harry Goward any more than I did because he'd borrowed Sid's best racket and left it out in the rain and then just laughed. So he said, not sad enough. Give it to me. I'll fix it. He had some molasses candy that he'd bit. He rubbed it over a little and then suddenly we heard Alice calling and he crammed the letter in his pocket, candy and all. And there were some other things that were stuck to it. We were so rattled when Alice appeared and demanded that very letter in her lordly way that I forgot if it, I had it or Sid. And I went all through my clothes looking for it, and then Sid found it in his, oh my. <laughs> Miss Alice turned up her nose when she saw it. It did look smudgy. Sid hurriedly scrubbed it with his handkerchief, but even that didn't really make it clean, and by that time you couldn't read the address. Alice didn't ask me if I'd read it, or I'd have told her. There was a fuss afterward in the family, but I kept clear of it. I wouldn't have time to get through what I have to do if I attended to their fusses, so all I knew was that it had something to do with that letter. All the family were taking trains like a procession for two or three days. I don't know why, so Lorraine can't expect me to write that down. There's only one other event of great signification that I know about, and nobody knows that except me and Dr. Danbig and Peggy. It was that way. 
The doctor saw me on the street one afternoon, I can't remember what day it was, and stopped his machine and me motioned me to get in. You bet I got. He shook his hands with me, just the way he would with father, as not if I were a contemptible puppy. Billy, my son, I want you to do something for me, he said. All right, said I. I've got to see Peggy, he went on. I've got to. And you looked as fierce as a circus tiger. I can't sit still and not lift a finger and let this wretched business go on. I won't lose her for any silly scruples. I didn't know what he was driving at, but I said I wouldn't either in a sympathetic manner. I've got to see her, he fired at me again. Yep, I said. She's at the house right now. Come on. But that didn't suit him. He explained she wouldn't look at him when the others were around and that she slid off and wormed out of his way so he couldn't get at her anyhow. Just like a girl, wasn't it? Not to face the music. Well, anyway, he cooked up a plan that he wanted me to do, and I promised I would. He wanted me to get Peggy to go up the river to their former spooning resort. Only he put it differently. <laughs> and he would be there waiting to make Peggy talk to him. Which he seemed to desire more than honey and a honeycomb. Lovers are a strange animal. I may be foolish, but I prefer toads. With them, you can tie a string around the hind leg and you got them. But with leather, lovers, it's all this way one way and upside down and the next. And... Wondering what's hurt feelings of her, and if he's got tired of you, and polyandering around to get interviews up rivers when you could easier sit on a piazza and talk, all, and all such. It seems to me that things would go a lot simpler if everybody would cut out most of the feelings department and just eat their meals and look after the animals and play all they get time for and then go to sleep quietly. Bussing is such a depravity. But they wouldn't do what I said, not if I told them. So I let it lie low and think. Next morning, I harnessed the pony in the cart. Peg, take a drive with me. Come on. And Peg looked gratified. And Mother said I was a dear, thoughtful child. And Grandma said it would do the girl good. And I was a noble lad, so I got ecomiums all around for once. Only Aunt Elizabeth, she looked thoughtful. I ragged. Rattled Hotspur, that's the pony, out to a happy hunting ground by the river, till I saw Dr. Denbigg's gray cat behind a bush, and I rightly argued that this manly form was hitched onto it, for he arose up in his might, and I stopped the cart. Peggy gasped and said, Oh, oh, we must go home. Oh, Billy, drive on, which... Billy didn't do. Not so you'd notice it. Then the doctor said, in his I am the Ten Commandments manner, <laughs> Get out, Peggy, and held his hand. And Peggy said, I won't, I can't, and immediately did the goose. Billy, my son, he said, will you kindly deprive us of the light and the presence for one hour? By the clock. Here's my timepiece. One hour. Go. And he gave me hot spur and a slap. So he leaped. Dr. Denbigh is the most different person from Harry Goward I know. Well, I drove around the Red Bridge and was gone an hour and twelve minutes. And I thought they'd be missing me and in a fit to go home. So I just raced hot spur the last mile. I'm awfully sorry I'm so late, said I. I got looking at some pigs, so I forgot. I'm sorry, said I. Peg looked up at me as if she couldn't remember who I was. 
and inquired wonderingly, Is it an hour yet? And Dr. Denbigh said, Great Scott, boy, you needn't have hurried. That's lovers all over. And then they hadn't finished yet. You'll believe me. Dr. Denbigh went on talking as they stood up, just as if I wasn't living. You won't promise me, he asked her. And then she said, Oh, Jack, how can I? I don't know what to do, but I'm engaged to him. That's a solemn thing. Solemn nonsense, said the doctor. You don't love him. You never did. You never could. Be a woman, dearest, and end this wretched mess. I never would have thought I loved him if I hadn't believed I'd lost you. Peggy ruminated to herself. But I must think, as if she hadn't thunk for an hour. How long must you think? The doctor fired at her. Don't be cross at me, said she, like a baby that big, capable man picked up her hand and kissed it. Shame on him. No, no, dear, he said, as meek as a pie. I'll only... I'll wait. Only you must decide the right way and remember and that it's hard. Then he put her onto the cart clingingly. I'd have chucked her, and I leaned over toward him the last thing and threw my head lovingly on one side and rolled my eyes up and murmured at him, Goodbye, Jack, and started hot spur before he could hit me. Now, thank the stars, there's just one or two little items more that I've got to write. One is that I heard Mother tell Father that they were on the front piazza alone, and I was teaching the puppy to beg, right inside of them on the grass. They think I'm an earless freak, maybe. She told them that dear Peggy was grown into such a strong, splendid woman, and that she'd been talking to her, and she thought the child would be able to give her up her weak, vacillating lover with hardly a pang, because she hadn't realized that he was unworthy of her. That Peg had said she couldn't marry a man she didn't admire. And wasn't that noble of her? Noble of your grandmother to give up a perfect lady like Harry Goward (laughs) when she's got a real man up her sleeve. I'd have made him sit up and take notice if I hadn't promised not to tell, which reminds me that I ought to explain how I got Dr. Denbigh to let me write for Lorraine. I put it to him strongly, you see, about the cookies, and at first he said, Not on your life. Not in a thousand years. And then... But what's the use of writing that? Lorraine is all on to all that. But I pickles. Won't there be a circus when Alice finds out I've known things that she didn't? Won't Alice be hopping? Gee. End of chapter 10 Recorded by David Stryker